this okay. computer. All right, we are live. All right. Hello, I'm Tom Harris. I'm the director of the University Center for Economic Development, and this is one of our COVID-19 uh, webinars. Uh, most of you remember in 1919, it was a famous uh, flu epidemic that hit the United States, and people always talk and compare it to what's going on today. Today, we have Dr. Tessa Conroy from the University of Wisconsin, who made a presentation. I, did, I saw that she graciously accepted our invite to do a presentation again on COVID-19. Uh, if you think back in 1919, always uh, when, when we were leading up to this, the state of Nevada had a population of 88,000, and the city of Las Vegas had only 2,000 people. So this was before Hoover Dam and massive gambling. But there was a lot of things that were similar. So uh, Tessa, I'll let you go right ahead, and uh, uh, um, I'm looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for having me. It's fun to get to talk about all of this uh, with you guys here and think about what it looked like in another state. As Tom mentioned, I was kind of trying to understand a pandemic. This is my first pandemic and wanting to think about, well, how, what, how is this going to look? How is this going to play out? And it seemed like the, the most natural reference point to some extent was to look back at this historical flu and, and think about what happened. So I'll be sharing with you what I learned and I will go ahead and share my screen here with you all. All right, so um, in, in my own research of this, I was really sort of trying to ask the economic questions and understand what the economic impacts would be, would be, but there's just a lot of context to also think about. So I'll try to highlight that. But one of the, the things that I learned, kind of what can, what can we uh, observe looking back at the 1918 flu that would be relevant to what we're learning today, and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the punchline, which is to some extent, uh, not a lot. It was just so very different. So that's one of the directions we're heading, and I want to um, spend the better part of today talking about kind of the policy differences that I uh, learned about when I I was looking at the, the different contexts between then and now. Uh, so the 1918 flu at the state level. As Tom mentioned, I just want to give a little bit of context, you know, very, very different um, landscape in Nevada, much like for Wisconsin back then than it is now. Um, it, the flu arrived a few weeks before uh, the end of World War One, so six weeks before the end of World War One here in Wisconsin, and my understanding is about similar in Nevada, um, looking at kind of what things showed up in Reno and Las Vegas, for example. Um, and it, it came back. So even though we had this kind of first instance of the flu, it came um, even um, back in the fall of 1919. So these kind of multiple waves, which we see kind of talking about now that we should expect perhaps multiple waves uh, of the, the flu virus. Uh, the best records that I could find uh, were that there were between four and 5,000 cases in Nevada. And this is at a time when kind of, as Tom mentioned, there were about 80 to 90,000 people. So give you a sense of the scope of the impact. Uh, my sense though is that these are low estimates that the reporting for the, the flu um, pandemic at that point or epidemic at that point was uh, mixed up with the seasonal flu and a number of other um, ailments, so it might be hard to track and just the nature of recording was um, more difficult at that time. So these are kind of our best numbers when I'm uh, sharing with you today. One of the things that was most interesting to me was thinking about how the public health response varied. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about Wisconsin just because that's what I focused on, but Wisconsin was, uh, to our knowledge, the only state that implemented a statewide comprehensive public health initiative. So we had taken some steps uh, kind of in the, I want to say late 1800s to have a state health board and following that implementation of the state health board, every county had to have a local uh, health official. So we had this network in place. So when the flu hit, we were able to create this coordinated effort and all of the localities had a direct link to the state level. And so when they went to go ahead and, for example, shut down public institutions, we had a pretty quick and pretty effective way to get that around the state and do that kind of in a coordinated way. And that Wisconsin stuck out because we were pretty compliant that the state, most people um, followed those guidelines and um, complied with what the State Board of Health was ordering. When I read about Nevada, uh, as far as I could see, the, the response was much more localized. So I kind of read um, instances of 
the local decision makers in Reno, for example, uh, making several mandates in terms of, you know, when things were going to close down and which types of institutions would close down. And then similarly, um, in Las Vegas, you know, again, decisions made at the local level. So a little bit of a less coordinated uh, type of effort in terms of the public health response. Uh, and I also noticed, and um, as a West Coaster, uh, I, I couldn't help but chuckle that the policies were much more contentious there in the West, kind of the Wild West, um, than they were in Wisconsin. And uh, that was striking to me too, just that this sort of difference in terms of how that those public health initiatives were received by the public and how people responded and whether those were followed or not and that sort of thing. So um, a couple different observations there. In terms of the interruptions to daily life, for me too, these were also fairly similar in, in some ways to what we're seeing now. So we had a sense back then that large gatherings could spread infection. Uh, we were worried about ventilation and you know, encouraged hosting of events outside and that sort of things. Uh, residents were directed to avoid crowds, much like we are now. Localities closed, closed their schools, movie theaters, bars, restaurants, and churches. And in Nevada, I noticed that the, the closing the mines even came up. Uh, and then they had mask mandates in Reno and Las Vegas. And this was really intriguing to me as well, just because I hadn't seen that in anything in Wisconsin. So uh, I'm sure I'm biased looking at my own state, but you know, thinking, oh, we have this great state coordinated effort, but no masks. And um, we kind of seem to think that now that that's a really important part of public health and the fact that Reno and Las Vegas both had these uh, mandates in place and there are photos of people wearing their masks even you know, 100 years ago was just really striking to me. And that seems to be something that, um, at least as far as the research I've done so far, didn't show up everywhere that um, they had, Reno and Las Vegas at least had that one figured out. Um, the flu changed life. So the flu was most severe, the flu virus at that time was most severe for prime age adults, especially men. So that's very different from now. So now it seems to be the case that um, folks that are 65 or older seems to be most at high risk or folks with underlying health conditions. And in my reading about, um, you know, this last flu instance, it was that the almost the healthiest people had the strongest immune reactions and then had the worst outcome. So kind of young working age men were especially vulnerable. Um, so this meant that families were often losing a breadwinner, which could be really crippling kind of at the household level in terms of their economic stance. Um, in Wisconsin, we had an election at that time and that campaign switched for, to mail outreach uh, versus kind of these in-person rallies. And in uh, learning about Nevada, I saw a similar headline that um, there was supposed to be some sort of campaign rally. Uh, I forget which um, city that was located, but it ultimately was shut down because of uh, the epidemic at that time. Uh, businesses, of course, suffered months of missed revenue. Uh, and then saw pockets, though, of where businesses were actually doing quite well, kind of similar to how we see uh, today. So, for example, looking at some numbers, it seems to be the case that, you know, the health industry spending has gone up, which we would expect, but also in groceries. Those, so there are pockets of the economy where we're seeing this growth. And it seems to be the case that that was observed even back then, that, of course, um, health and health-adjacent industries didn't have the same sort of losses, of course, that the saloons, um, the bars, the restaurants had. Um, and, and we're seeing that now, that those are some of the sectors that are really feeling the, the most devastating impacts. Um, as farmers fell ill, animals went untended and fields went unharvested. And again, for me, this had, it's not, of course, exactly the same, but an interesting analog today. I was first learning about this and re kind of reading about these farmers at a time when um, we were having our first outbreaks in some of our meatpacking plants, and there was a lot of concern about our food supply. And I think we're here, we're seeing kind of the, the people that um, are essential to the supplying food for the population are just really important. And, and when we lose those, we start to work worry about those food supply challenges. So an interesting analog there. Uh, hospitals still faced a shortage of beds and healthcare workers. So um, I'm looking at Georgia now and they had a pretty, as far as I can tell, well-coordinated system of localities requesting from um, their state board of health that volunteers from the Red Cross come. So that they, at the state level, would then kind of have this coordinated effort of sending doctors and nurses to the towns that needed them at the moments of their outbreaks and that sort of things. Uh, and read about similar things in Nevada where, where they were converting lodging facilities, for example, into temporary hospitals. Um, 
And just the number of stories I read about kind of the gratitude for doctors and nurses then also resonated with me as an interesting analog. Um, the way we're sort of lifting up our healthcare workers and other essential folks right now uh, that had echoes um, in this kind of historical instance as well that people were just so grateful for the dedication that the doctors and nurses showed back then. Um, several localities implemented anti-influenza ed educational initiatives. So just, you know, this is as simple in some instances is of making sure people know to cover their mouth when they cough, uh, to go home if they don't feel well, to wash their hands. These are some of the public health initiatives um, that we saw back then. And again, seeing similar things today, we're all being instructed on how to wash our hands properly and seeing how to be birthday two times and these sorts of things. So I um, saw so those educational initiatives even back then. And one thing that continues to um, intrigue me is that, that I think, uh, I'll just speak for myself, that there's a sense of, you know, things constantly changing and we're constantly learning about the, the current virus and um, kind of how it works and how, how we should best deal with it and that sort of thing. And it, it, it feels slow at times, I think, to some extent. And I had to take a step back when I was learning about uh, this historical context and just how long it took to understand the 1918 flu. And if you think, you know, we're kind of slow in our learning now, man, it was just extra challenging in 1918. And this is a time when we're sort of just starting to articulate, to, to my understanding, the differences between virus and bacteria. So for initially going into the 19, 1918 flu, there was a lot of um, skepticism that this was a bacterial infection. Um, I read some accounts of, you know, there was a, a swine flu in one part of the country at that time. And so there was confusion about, you know, is this an animal to human transmission? And so it just took a really long time for people to understand what the virus was and how it worked, um, how people got sick and that sort of thing. Uh, so even though it, you know, I, I kind of feel similar, like a slow learning right now, it was just especially um, difficult to kind of progress in understanding at that time as well. Uh, the rural versus urban comparison is, is, of course, a bit difficult just because of the lack of data. So that's, again, I just want to highlight, um, we didn't collect the data in 1918 the way we do now. So kind of documenting the difference between rural and urban is a little bit difficult. But um, in general, rural faces challenges of scattered populations, few healthcare workers, um, limited resources left people dangerously uninformed. So some of the things that I saw, for example, in reading is that um, whereas more urban or more densely populated parts uh, or um, cities had the resources for these public health initiatives where they could kind of help people understand the importance of, you know, covering their mouth or washing their hands. There just weren't those sorts of resources necessarily in a lot of our rural communities and, and people that were maybe on the outskirts and, and not um, interacting with sort of a public health mechanism might not get that education. Uh, so that became a, a barrier, a bit of a barrier to rural health. Uh, in urban areas though, sort of different challenges, just the density of people uh, caused the number of patients to overwhelm healthcare systems in, in some of our more urban areas. In general, though, um, unfortunately, Nevada wasn't included uh, in the study that I looked at, but I, I will just say that that's partly because of the census areas at that time. To my knowledge, I want to say they collected data on 28 states at that time, and Nevada wasn't one of them, so I hope you'll forgive the sort of lack of specificity, but of the states they did collect, uh, we found that the ratio of the mortality rate for cities was higher than the state average. So, for example, in Wisconsin, the mortality rate in cities was 1.17 as a ratio to the state average. That implies that rural areas generally fared better, and we saw that pretty much across all the states that um, were reported. So death rates varied across the country. Here I'm showing an old graphic, and uh, you'll see kind of Milwaukee at the bottom and Philadelphia at the top. So you see this sort of uh, variation in the mortality rates across these different urban areas. And in trying to understand, you know, wh where does this variation come from? I think there were, have been a lot of explanations explored. Some of the research that I read said that, you know, we actually can't explain these due to climate, for example. We can't explain these due to geography or even economic conditions. What seems to matter is when did the flu arrive? So like Wisconsin, my understanding is that the flu arrived relatively late in Nevada than it did compared to other parts of the country, such as um, the, uh, the um, other, in other parts of the country. 
So, and then population density really matters. So those states that were less densely populated tended to do better as well. And then the last factor that has been explored is the extent and speed of non-pharmaceutical interventions. So those non-pharmaceutical interventions such as social distancing. So the states that seem to implement those faster and more swiftly, more aggressively, um, seemed to um, perhaps fare a bit better. Uh, so the success in Wisconsin, you saw Milwaukee at the bottom of that graphic is again credited to this kind of comprehensive statewide approach as well as the low population density and late arrival. Um, and again, you know, another analog for me is that the, the flu, uh, the current flu seems to, um, or coronavirus, it seems to arrive later in Wisconsin than it did, of course, on the coast in this particular instance. Uh, so some evidence that there is the swift and aggressive interventions help the economy once the pandemic was over. So it seems to be the case that um, swift and aggressive intervention is associated uh, with a better economic performance once the pandemic was over. And this is a study of the 1918 flu. And I had somebody ask me, well, why is that? And to my knowledge, we haven't quite pinned that down, but if we were to speculate about what might be driving that, um, some explanations that come to mind is, you know, consumer confidence is one. So if it's the case that um, these swift and aggressive interventions lead to um, consumer confidence that the virus is under control and we can return to work and return to restaurants safely, uh, that that might spur a more expeditious economic recovery. Um, it might be that you just have more healthy people because the virus is under control. So some of those explanations might be at play here. In terms of the economic impacts, uh, again, hard to track down at the local level with the data available. One study suggests that at the country level, because again, this is um, around the world, uh, the GDP declines were in the range of 6% per year at the country level. Some studies have found that wages went up, and this is sort of a classical economic argument that uh, if you were to cut the supply of workers, as the flu did, then that would restrict labor supply and drive wages up. And that then kind of culminates in income growth. So the workers that are available tend to have to produce more. So you get that increase in worker productivity, higher wages that I just mentioned. So you saw income growth in the states that were more uh, heavily hit by the virus. So um, that's all needs to be placed in context, of course, with there were these large immediate declines in productivity, large overall less lost economic activity. So even though there are these perhaps instances of kind of a silver lining or a bright spot that, and you know, that shouldn't be lost in the kind of overall scheme of pretty severe productivity losses, uh, as well as just economic activity in general. What's interesting, though, is that these effects were pretty short-lived, and I think you see um, some economists speculating that we'll have, again, sort of short-lived consequences of this pandemic, uh, so that, you know, that you see these immediate negative economic consequences with, you know, stay at home or safer at home orders, but, you know, as we go back to normal, if we get to go back to normal, that some of those effects will be relatively short-lived, and I think we're yet to see if that will um, play out. So, and I drew, I drew several analogs kind of in this first section, but I just want to highlight some ways in which it's a complicated comparison. And of course, it's just a very different um, world today. So the 1918 flu, as I mentioned, was most severe for the working age population. So that's one difference from now is that it seems to be most severe from folks who are probably more likely in the retirement age category. Um, the 1918 flu spread along transportation routes and, and we see that today, and I read about this for Nevada specifically, they're very worried about the railroads, that people coming in on the rail cars, um, they're, you know, talks, do we kind of do checks, health checks on folks? Do we um, let them into the state? These sorts of things. Uh, and today it's just even more complicated. We travel at a much larger volume and a greater speed over a much more extensive network. Uh, so that's more complicated. Production is geographically dispersed, and here what I have in mind is supply chains. So even though, um, you know, China might be being affected by the virus or by the coronavirus, and it's not happening here in Wisconsin or there in Nevada, it could be the case that via the supply chain, if we're missing out on kind of that input that would go into our production process, it has a way of disrupting production kind of around the world. Uh, so it becomes very hard to kind of contain the effects of 
a virus to just one region that it spreads through these kind of supply chain or creates these linkages regionally through supply chains. And then at that point too, the effects are potentially conflated with a wartime economy. So we're just coming out of World War I and kind of untangling those effects um, becomes difficult. That said, um, you know, since 1918, this you know, current recession is our 19th recession. So we've had a lot of opportunities to learn about and kind of conduct to some extent experiments about how to deal with an economic downturn. So a couple things that I found interesting. So unemployment insurance didn't exist, you know, 100 years ago, uh, the way it does today. Wisconsin was the first state to pass unemployment insurance into law, and that was in 1932. So some of these federal programs that are meant to sort of mitigate the negative effects, particularly for folks who are um, kind of hit with the most devastating consequences, were in place at that time. Uh, similarly, Social Security or the old age survivors and disability insurance, which might have provided relief to some of those families, for example, who lost a loved one, um, that program wasn't in place. That wasn't until 1935. Um, for those states that didn't already have unemployment insurance, they also got those programs with the Social Security Act of 1935. And that's really important. Um, one of the things I just, you know, to kind of highlight the impact of these programs is I just pulled the initial unemployment claims from for Nevada, showing you 2019 in red in that graphic and then 2020 in orange. You can just see the dramatic spike and you probably have maybe seen these figures in the news, but, you know, 300,000 initial unemployment claims, uh, claims during uh, about a four week period. So just the breadth of something like an unemployment insurance program really touches a lot of lives and it wasn't in place, you know, at the time of um, the 1918 flu. And economic policy was very different in general. That's just one program, but just our whole way we thought about intervening in a recession was very different. So classical economic thinking, sort of pre-1930s school of thought would have said, you know, let the markets correct correct themselves, there was probably very, really little appetite for a policy intervention at that time. It wasn't really until um, John Maynard Keynes was writing in the 1930s and we had the Great Depression that we saw sort of the rise of fiscal stimulus the way you know, we might think about it today as sort of a major government spending bill that's meant to offset a downturn. Um, similarly, the Federal Reserve was far less uh, involved in kind of correcting a downturn than we might expect or see today. So here with the Employment Act of 1946, we start to see this first congressional declaration of policy. And I have the language um, there on the slide. Basically, it's just saying that, you know, they view it as within their duty to use policy um, and their measures to create conditions for useful employment for all of those people um, that are able and willing and want to work. So we kind of start to see government saying, you know, it's our job to make sure there are jobs uh, for the first time. And interestingly, um, no mention yet here quite yet of price stability, but that, that's coming. Um, in terms of 1918, the Federal Reserve Bank was just five years old at the time. So a brand new institution. So you know, I feel like we see the Federal Reserve all over the news right now, and it was just in its sort of infancy at this point in time, and it had mainly focused on financing the war effort. Um, and the dual mandate of price stability and full employment for the Federal Reserve didn't come along until 1977. So the way we think of the Federal Reserve sort of being involved in maintaining, again, price stability, full employment, maintaining um, the economy in a way that works for all of us, it wasn't really present, you know, in 1918, so very different policy environment. So kind of fast forward, again, this is, you know, our 19th recession. We've had lots of opportunities to um, implement policies that would correct a downturn, and we've sort of arrived at two approaches to policy, uh, perhaps an oversimplification in a lot of ways, but we have monetary policy, which is at the discretion of the Federal Reserve. Uh, they tend to focus on lowering the interest rates on debts incurred on large purchases, so like homes and cars, for example. 
Um, but this has been critiqued over time. The Federal Reserve has been critiqued over time. So starting in the 1980s, I would say monetary policy, it seems, was kind of the preferred mechanism for correcting a downturn. Um, but even the Federal Reserve was cr sort of critiqued for, you know, are they sometimes prioritizing price stability? Are they sometimes prioritizing full employment? Um, but a common tool coming out of the 1980s and then fiscal policy is determined by Congress and the White House. And these are changes in tax rates and government spending to sort of offset, for example, declines in consumer spending uh, and again, medicated downturn. And this is critique too. Um, fiscal policy can be slow to impact the economy. Uh, but when we saw that stagflation in the 1970s, we thought, um, so th I should back up, um, kind of coming out of the, the Great Depression, uh, World War II, fiscal policy was sort of com a common strategy. Then we hit stagflation in the 1970s. And that's when we thought about, okay, we probably need a new policy. And we saw the rise of monetary policy. Um, and fiscal policy really became a secondary tool to use only when the Fed has sort of exhausted their ability to lower the interest rate below the zero bound. So kind of two approaches now coming into um, the Great Recession 10 years ago. And that's where I get to our approach today. So we, we no longer allow the market to you know, self-correct as we might have in 1918. We don't wait for the economy to resume a potential growth trajectory. Uh, I, I, my sense is that the American public sort of expects a policy intervention. And when we got to the Great Recession, the interest rates, so the monetary policy tool from the Federal Reserve interest rates reached their zero bound. And so we saw then, let's do fiscal stimulus alongside this monetary policy. Um, and again, these policies are still debated. It's, um, you know, very contentious. We're still, you know, lots of conversations. Economists are going to talk about, you know, what we're doing today for the next 10 or 20 years, at least, I'm sure. Um, but we're still at this place where we're using a combination of tools to address an economic downturn. So monetary policy alongside fiscal policy um, to mitigate an economic downturn. Uh, as far as today and looking at how we've responded to the current situation, um, the Fed has lowered interest rates to near zero. So again, using um, monetary policy to offset the downturn. They've also issued some forward guidance, meaning they've indicated a plan to keep interest rates low. They've moved forward with some quantitative easing. They're not calling it that, but it's basically quantitative easing, so large purchases of financial assets, and then taken several steps to stabilize markets in terms of um, injecting liquidity and um, preventing a credit crunch type of situation. And then we have fiscal policy also. Um, so again, this is from the Congress and the White House, changes to tax rates and government spendings. We've seen three bills. Um, the first was an emergency funding bill. Then we saw the Families First Coronavirus Act. And then most recently, the CARES Act. Um, so Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Uh, this was a $2.3 trillion fiscal stimulus package, the largest ever in U.S. history. Uh, so very unique. Again, I don't think we would have seen um, this type of policy initiative in um, 1918. One thing that I think is interesting here, too, is that these are familiar tools at this point. A, a fiscal stimulus is a, sort of a familiar tool at this point, using monetary policy to offset a downturn. Again, we've been using this now uh, for quite some time, so these are fami familiar tools to us, but unfamiliar circumstances. Economic downturns are usually caused by a supply shock, a demand shock, or a financial shock. And the pandemic had aspects of all three coming into it. So it's a very difficult policy environment to understand kind of which is the right um, lever to pull in terms of, again, pulling us out of more, more quickly out of an economic downturn. I think, you know, the question is, are we in a better position than in 1918? And, and I think we all hope so, especially policymakers. Uh, but at the very least, you know, this will be another learning opportunity for us. and and. I think it's hard to say if we're getting it right. I did read one study recently that kind of pointed to perhaps a, some evidence that at least one of the policy mechanisms worked, and that was a study from MIT. And their study shows that the Paycheck Protection Program saved between 1.4 and 3.2 million jobs. So, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, the, these opportunities to learn from past recessions and craft policy uh, that can 
impact people's lives in a way that you know helps them recover that helps us kind of get back on track as an economy uh, maybe we've at least accomplished that much i think we all certainly hope so so um, with that that's all i have for you today again thanks so much for having me i really enjoyed getting to talk about all of this with you i've learned a lot well, thank you, Tessa. Yes, that's very interesting about the history because we need to be aware of it. I think it's interesting about the uh, the word origins of the Spanish flu from the is that uh, we were in World War One. There was press coverage of uh, uh, the both Germany, America, and and England and France wouldn't allow information come out about the flu until after the war ended. It got the name Spanish flu because Spain was a neutral country in World War Two, and they were reporting it. So uh, I guess, you know, that's, uh, but anyway, it's, yes, we have changed a lot. We are, our medical facilities are a lot different. The transportation, like you said, different modes all over the place. There are some similarities and uh, I think you're right. It's interesting how many recessions we've had since 1919. We're slowly learning. I hope we learn our lesson. Yeah, and, uh, I hope so. And uh, the, thank you very much. I was going to say, have you made this kind of presentation to other states? I am doing another one in Georgia next week, but uh, other than Wisconsin, Nevada, and Georgia, right, that's yeah. all. Yeah. I was wondering what anything different in Georgia from your. Uh, it's a southern um, state versus a western. Georgia was the first state where I read about a group of scientists that directed by the State Board of Health that uh, were working on a vaccine. And it was a little bit of guesswork because mm -hmm. they thought it was bacterial, perhaps. So it was them working on their best guess in terms of develop developing a vaccine and kind of hoping it worked out. And uh, it was the first time that I read about a scramble for a vaccine kind of in the context of a state level initiative. And I thought that was really interesting. As it's, well. it's, it is interesting that how long we've gone that we know there's a difference between bacterial infections and viral infections, which this mm -hmm. is, this is what, uh, what happened. Uh, Bob, uh, Tessa, thank you very much. And I uh, hope people who, Watch this. If you have any questions, send them to me. I'll send them to Tessa. And if you have any other comments, I'm sure both she and I would like to have. If you have any uh, information of what you what you understand what happened in 1919 in the great state of Nevada, <laughs> of uh, very only 88,000 people in those time periods, yeah. and only one university. But anyway, we'll uh, uh, see Bob grin in there. But anyway, I'll let you let you go, and I appreciate it. And uh, have a good day, Tessa. Appreciate you very much. All right, thank you. Thank Take you. Care.